Thank you all for joining this session. Um, you know, the, the idea of learning from failure, um, that's so heavy. And I, I think if, if we considered everything that we did that didn't go quite right, failure, it, it would be a painful existence and, and it, would be, it wouldn't give us enough grace. And so as we all are, or many of us here are engaging in work around equity and coalition building and partnerships and really trying to learn authentically through reflection, um, one of the things that, that comes up is what happens when things don't go as planned. And so many of you, um, you know, I do work at NSF. And so in proposals, we're really looking for people to be clear about what challenges you expect and what the processes you have um, to address those challenges. It's also, how are you building in for the unexpected? How are you building in that emotional piece? The emo sometimes, some people call it emotional resilience. Um, other folks talk about, you know, what are just the logistics and the structures? How do we build in structures to make it through those times where, where things don't go as it planned, where you've got a, an, an assessment that just doesn't fit with the, with the group of people, or you've stepped, you've stepped in something um, when you're talking about, uh, you're talking with partners. And so we all deal with this. And so there's, there's three teams that have been very generous um, with us and they are willing to share some of the challenges that they've faced and how they are constructively addressing them. And so, um, first of all, thank you to the teams. Um, and we really look forward to your thoughts and we greatly appreciate your willingness to move beyond the rah-rah, things are always great and we always know how to make things work, to the more authentic, we're in this and we're in this together and we're in this to figure it out. So with that, um, we'll turn to Deepak and Nathan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, my name is Deepak Keshwani. I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska, and I'm a PI on a project that we got funded jointly with AZEL and the Infuse Initiative to develop immersive video games uh, to connect to sort of fuse systems. And we have got a lot of challenges and failures that we had to address and overcome. The first thing I'll start off with is invite you to join us in the poster later on today if you want to learn more about our project. We're in room number five. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is COVID. You know, I, when, when COVID hit us, I thought our project, if anything, would be really ready to still kind of deliver because, you know, we're building video games delivered virtually, completely counterintuitive. What we thought wasn't the case turned out that there was so much happening online that there was just so little appetite to even use some of our programs. I mean, it was just kind of just exhaustion with anything online. So we really had to struggle with that. And it was kind of counterintuitive, not just in this project, but some other projects that we're doing virtually. So that was one thing. The other thing was we changed fundamentally the core product that we were developing about halfway through our project. And I'll let Nathan take over that. Hi all, I'm Nathan Rice. I'm the 4-H educator out of Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And so in the early on in this project, I was the grad student that helped start it. So there was two of us grad students that were kind of the leads on developing in this in the engineering department. And so we took off and, and we were super excited. Like we we're making a video game. All of us had loved video games and it was on agriculture, which is, is where I grew up. And so we dove into it and the title of our, our grant was Immersive Simulation Game. So obviously, we wanted to be as immersive as possible. We took on a 3D dimensional game and we went for it. Um, needless to say, we had no idea all of the craziness that goes into developing a 3D video game, right? Like there's just so much that goes into that. And so as we start diving in, we have to set the whole groundwork of the game, right? And so we we go through all that process. We meet with all the specialists and, and the community partners that we're going to be working with. And we set what we want to be in this game. And it was a big list, right? And so then we go and we turn around to make the game. And within a year, the graphics seemed like they were flowing okay. Like we we're getting scenes that looked pretty good. And then the actual computer programming part of making all of the interactions and the immersive part come together. Uh, was really tough, right? We, we quickly realized that we were probably a little bit in over our head. And at that point, it was actually two years in the project and I was seeing we were in over our head and I was a master student. And I was like, all right, guys, I'll see you later. And, and that's when 
a big a big shift happened actually, and I'll let Deepak kind of talk about how we switched from that 3D initial start uh, to what they went to currently. Yeah, so a big part of the challenges that we encountered in our early uh, beta testing was, you know, hardware compatibility, installation concerns, platform limitations. You know, a lot of our stakeholders are using Chromebooks, and we really, you know, a lot of what we were doing wasn't easy to implement there. Uh, it was at that point that I took on as PI for the project, uh, and we made a big pivot to 2D, right? Simplified the development cycle. Really, there was a big challenge in transition because we had to figure out, you know, there is always this sunk cost kind of, you know, we've got all this work, how do we leverage that towards the 2D environment? Uh, so we made that transition, but the value was immense. Uh, we were now able to do our development time between versions of the game became faster. We were able to respond more quickly as people told us, hey, there's this component that needs to be added or here's where it's not scientifically accurate. Here's where you can improve. Uh, and so I think that we got a lot of value out of this by pivoting to a 2D. Uh, we hope that we're going to have much more uh, broader uh, impact. We'll be able to disseminate our products quite a bit. I think the, uh, so that was kind of one big hurdle we all came. The second transition was um, staff related. You know, we were using primarily graduate students, uh, not thinking about the scope of the project. And as we got COVID extensions, those initial students disappeared. Like Nathan, they went on to better things. At least Nathan is still involved as a community <laughs> partner now. But we then decided to rebudget our proposal to pay for a full-time software developer and manager that helped us kind of fill in the gaps between students. So that was another sort of big challenge we overcame was continuity over a multi-year project when we were primarily relying on students. The students did a great job, but we had to still continue once they graduated. Uh, I'll let Nathan take on sort of the third sort of uh, issue that we had to overcome. Yeah, and so uh, as I transitioned on in my role, I went into the extension realm. And so I teach youth uh, on the daily from all different age groups, K through 12. And that's, that's what this game was focused for. And so I actually got to take it to the step and as they started getting the final tuning on their games they sent them to me to beta test them with students and so we learned a lot through that process as well and I think some of the main things like when you're dealing with just thinking about gamification and education how do we bring games to students and actually get them to learn something and so what we learned from that is clear instructions are tough right when you're making a game uh, you can design the entire game and it probably takes as long for the tutorial in the beginning as the rest of the game took to develop. And so that was kind of an interesting thing that they came to is you have this great game and how it works, but you have to show people within a very, very limited time frame how to play it correctly. And so getting students to that point and, and making the game to that point was really, really challenging. Um, the second part to that was uh, youth and teachers are very, very nice when they find out that the game was developed by students. That was a cool concept. Like they were very, very forgiving. The game was by no means uh, a professionally done video game, but when they found out that it was other students that were undergrads or graduate students that were working on it, they loved it, right? That's when it came home to them because it was close to them. It was something that they could see themselves doing. They played video games in their life and they could see a way of getting there, right? It wasn't perfect, but it was, it was fun and it and engaged them and it made, gave them kind of a hope for the future. So that was really cool uh, to see. And then the last thing, when you want to get teaching across in a video game, it's really tough to just have the video game and leave. Uh, it's challenging to get all those learning concepts in there to have them think about what they're learning and what they're doing. And so almost a hybrid approach is necessary. Uh, you need to have, the video game is great. It engages them, they like it and they remember it, but you need that other traditional lecture slash activity afterwards that helps them think about and digest what they just went through. And so that was the last learning that we found from implementing with youth. And I'll just end there by just highlighting that, you know, COVID, not what we thought. Uh, we were, we, we, we got permission from our program manager to kind of shift course halfway through. So don't be afraid to ask for permissions to make major changes like that. And the third piece was just supplementing the games with some of the other sort of aspects related to what can help foster the learning outcome. So we've been actually using open source tools like Loopy as sort of supplementary learning objects that support our video game. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just throw it back out to our moderator queue and happy to ask any, answer any questions or engage on chat.
All right. So I think next up is Prinda and Alex. Alice, excuse me. Hi, everyone. My name is Alice Anderson. I'm in Minneapolis, uh, where there's currently a thunderstorm. So I look like I'm in some sort of cave here. But I'm here with my colleague, Prinda. Do you want to just say hi, Prinda? And then, um, who is at the tech in probably very sunny San Jose, I'm assuming. No, not sunny. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Oh, in my mind. Not what I expected. Um, so we're here to talk about a project that we're working on together um, that actually has failure in the title. Um, myself and two other colleagues, Adam Maltese and Amber Simpson, have been studying the role of failing in maker spaces and maker activities, especially at informal learning spaces like science museums, but also in um, schools that have taken on maker learning, um, actually over the past six years. So our first grant actually was a um, eager grant, which uh, in its um, in its appeal has the word risk in it. You have to be doing something that's a little bit risky, which is why you need the money quickly right now, um, and it's a shorter time period. And so we thought it would be a good good fit for the concept of failure. Um, it really came about because the, the three of us had been um, doing other research with maker spaces and maker learning, where we heard a lot of educators say things like, I want my students, I want my learners to experience struggle. I want them to learn persistence. I want them to seek multiple solutions for their problems, but I don't want them to get so frustrated that they never come back and try it again. So how do I design a learning environment that looks like that? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, let's figure that out. Um, so at the time I was at the Science Museum of Minnesota and had the great privilege of working with some educators there on the floor, um, starting to uncover this question um, through summer camps. And, you know, it's sort of, we had one theory, it kept building, it kept building, it kept building. There's so much complexity, I think, that people bring with them both individually as part of their program, or excuse me, so individually as part of the activity system, as part of the program and what the program promises, then maybe what their institution um, um, sort of communicates about what uh, is acceptable or not within failure. And then again, going further and further, right? Your city, your culture, your society, it goes bigger and bigger. So, um, I could say a lot about that. I'll leave a, a link in the chat about our previous work. But Prinda and I are working together now on a community of practice project, ASL project, um, where we have six informal learning institutions that have two or three sort of lead educators who are overseeing maybe the staff who are on the floor or doing summer camps. And we're trying to work with them to think about um, how do you support those frontline educators um, to support learners through struggle and increase persistence. And I think one of the biggest takeaways for me so far has been just how much we've um, in the same sentence or even same conversation interchanged failure as self. So failure as an educator with failure of my student or my learner. And that's just a really interesting place to be in right now, and especially working really closely with these program leads for whom they are training and supporting those staff to honestly do a lot of unpacking <laughs> of, is this a deep feeling of failure for you? Or is this a feeling of failure for your learner? And what are the complexities? So one thing Prinna and I thought we could talk about a tiny bit would be just our own perspectives of failure, because I think one of the things we've been doing, the very first part of our project together has been naming failure. What does that come to mind for you? What is your um, sort of personal association with that? And how is that going to be showing up as you work with learners? And I'll, as just to kick us off, and then Prinda will, will share a little bit for herself. I think something that has really um, been very vulnerable and transparent, which is often a, a prerequisite for learning, I would say, is to say that my, the eager grant was the first time I was a co-PI, which was a big deal for me. But I also felt like I needed to know everything. <laughs> and I didn't because how could I? How could you know everything? And I think truly over years of working with the same colleagues on the same topic and idea has allowed me to have just more compassion for myself to say, of course, you don't know everything because you haven't done it yet. 
and you may be good at some things and they might be good at other things and you're really working as a team. And while I can say that very easily, it has literally taken years and uh, to embody that as well. And so now Prinda is gonna share a little bit from her perspective. Yeah, so as we were participating in the community of practice and talking about our own personal responses to failure, I, I actually found that really eye-opening to hear how other people respond to failure in the moment. That was one of the biggest pivotal things for me. So actually I would invite all of you in the chat to share a little bit about what your personal relationship is to failure. Like what is your visceral response? Is it whatever? Is it, you know, um, is it like um, a deep seated thing? I think for me, I, I realized that there's so many parts of my experience and identity that have built up this huge sense of perfectionism um, from my youth, from being from like an academic family, high achieving, and um, but also being that sort of Asian American model minority, like afraid to fail, the immigrant success, um, success um, expectations, um, to even like in my personal life of trying to be that perfect, like homekeeper, mother, but also still trying to work these like more than full-time jobs, right? Um, and that stereotype, stereotype threat that's involved there. And I think I think what's interesting about that is um, in we're, when we're trying to think about our teams that we're working with, potentially community partners that we're working with, um, there's gonna be a lot of different power dynamics at play that are going to be affecting, um, be affecting everybody's responses to failure. So, um, I think one of the first steps I would offer is, you know, trying to grapple with your own personal relationship to failure and then how that means you respond. Um, and then how might that affect your community partners? How is that reflected in your organization? Um, and I'll leave it there. Martin, do we have two more minutes? Okay, I think one more minute. So I think another piece that's really coming through in this community of practice model is that each of the six organizations reflecting more about the organizational culture of failure or not. Um, the welcomeness of failure of innovation of trying new things in their workplace culture versus um, um, not. And, I, and I'll quote my colleague at the art museum who says, um, you know, art museums are temples of perfection yes, we might care about progress, but on, at the end of the day, we're all about these pristine products that we have up on the walls. So how can we really communicate to learners and audience members that failing and whatever you wanna, you know, we don't have to use that word, but definitely maybe persisting on an idea over time is a value when we're only showing you the best things, which has been decided by a very small group of people. So it's a real tension, I think, in the work that is really interest. Of course, it's interesting, but I think we're meet, we're through this community practice model. Excuse me, uncovering also what actions we might want to take internally in our own own institutions to sort of nudge or push back or show other ways of doing things. And we'll have a poster at three as well. So come on by. Thank you. And now we will move to Sam and. Kevin. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm uh, Sam Johnston and I'm uh, at CAS, um, which is a, a education nonprofit for uh, work on sort of inclusive approaches to the design of learning. Um, we have a multi-gen makerspace um, that's in situated in affordable housing um, that we're co-designing with the community. Um, and I will let Kevin introduce himself and then talk a little bit about. Good afternoon, I'm Kevin Lewis. I'm with uh, the NHP Foundation Operation Pathways. We uh, provide affordable housing throughout uh, 13 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, we do different programs and services for our residents. We offer different programs and services and got connected through CAST and thought it would be a really cool and great idea to bring a makerspace to our site for our residents in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, the pandemic happened and the world turned on us um, at, at a critical time. And it it's one of those things that, you know, I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk about failure. I actually like failure, it sounds kind of strange, <laughs> but I think you, you learn a lot about yourself and what you're doing when things don't work the way you think they're supposed to work, 
right? And so I'm a coach and I always, I, I'm one of those coaches, I, I love a loss, right? Because I can teach and talk about what we didn't do well. Because when people are winning and things are going well, sometimes you don't, you don't pay attention to stuff, right? You don't see the gaps. And so I think failure gives you an opportunity to kind of look behind the curtain and see, you know what, this isn't the greatest plan in the world, right? And so you kind of had, we had that moment uh, with COVID uh, and it forced us to restructure how we were doing things. We had staffing challenges. Uh, you know, we, we had a staff person when we started this project who had been with us eight years. Uh, she had a, a, someone in her family get sick. She had to leave right when we were getting ready to start the project. We went through two other staff people who didn't fit. <laughs> Uh, and so it's, it's, it's been a kind of a roller coaster ride and eventually we landed on someone who's from the community who gets this, who likes this and we're doing well right now. Um, so that was that was difficult. We work at, with, at a property apartment community. And so when COVID hit, the, the property management company shut down all the spaces. So we had this really wonderful maker space that residents were going to be able to come to. Um, and lo and behold, everything was shut down. And so we had to really re-engage and be creative in our approaches to how are we going to provide making opportunities for folks uh, in an environment where people can't gather. So um, we were able to do as the, 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 the state and the city lifted restrictions to do some outdoor activities with folks. So we, we took advantage of that and, uh, and did, had a fall fest and kind of did that. We give people remote making kits so they could take stuff home to make. Uh, we also uh, tried to do some uh, remote making with folks. So we purchased tablets and, and, and so folks could make with us over the, uh, over the Zoom. So there was a lot of adjusting and, 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 and changing to try to figure out what works and what, what didn't. Um, we also ran into a hurdle where part of our project was we wanted to uh, employ the residents in the making uh, of the activities and leading the activities. And we found the resident who was really gung ho about this and we were excited about her and uh, we were ready to, to hire her on to, to, the, to be a part of the project and work with us. And we came into another hurdle is that in affordable housing, we have a benefit cliff. And so residents, she was already at the, the, the tip, the top of what she could make. So working on our project would have put her over the top and made her have to pay market rent in Stanford, Connecticut, which is really expensive. So we had to re, re, re figure that out, right? And so one of the solutions to that was we realized, well, minors or, or uh, kids in college or in high school can work. It doesn't affect families, uh, their income. So we, 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 we uh, refocused and started to hire young people, teens to work in this space. So um, those types of things are kind of, have presented unique problems to us, but we always kind of been really flexible. I know Sam and her team has worked with our, our grant manager. Uh, I know, I think Deepak said earlier, they've been very flexible with us as we've had to adjust the, the project. So please, if you get stuck, reach out to your folks. Um, we also, another hurdle is the, we, we the purpose of this was to have this multi-generational multi makerspace where seniors were making with young kids and all this kind of, that hasn't come to fruition just yet. Um, our seniors haven't really engaged as we thought they were, and we think part of that is COVID. Um, and so as we open, reopen the spaces, we're, we're trying to figure out now ways to engage them in making uh, and to be more a part of the community of makers. So just some of, some of our challenges, I know Sam, you might've had some other stuff you want to add as well. No, I think that's a great um, summary, Kevin. I think the, the one thing I'll, I'll say is just sort of reflecting back to the, um, conversation, the presentation right before and, and um, you know, having a partner that doesn't expect you to, you know, Kevin and his team never made us feel like we were, you know, totally naive or, you know, you know, didn't know what we were doing because we'd encounter something like the benefit clips. They always were open to working with, with us on a solution. And, and what that's done is I think it's, it's sort of, you know, really let us be able to not get it all perfect and not be perfectionists in the space. And it's actually opened up a space for questioning our research a lot more, right? And so we're you know, having a lot of conversations about research justice um, and you know, how do we really make sure that research isn't something that the community doesn't own and doesn't feel a part of um, because you know, the way it's presented or whatever is not, um, is not 
you know, is not equitable or really shared. And so I think that um, all this work of having to adjust with a partner that really um, allowed that and was open to that has really allowed us to, to really be more present in the space as people who are trying to figure this out, you know, as opposed to, you know, having a clear plan and, you know, marching along um, on it, so. And I'll just say our other partners. So we've got CAST, uh, Operation Pathways, which is the resident services arm of the NHP Foundation and the BU Social Learning Lab. So we're all sort of collaborating together in, in, in kind of making this um, makerspace that's really gonna be owned and driven by the community in the community. Cool, so thank you all. So, the, so my next job is to do some synthesis. Um, and I love this piece. Um, so I'll throw some things out there and then we'll break up into groups and see what you think. So the, the, the two take homes I heard here, one was failure, it's around some, there's a, some failure um, is around some known challenges. And the other, the other piece I heard that crossed all of them was failure is a feature, not a bug. So I'll start with the um, failure as part of known challenges. And so, um, so being a program officer at NSF, I have learned that anytime tech is involved, there's a couple of things that are automatically gonna come up. One is um, the time versus the tech. The more out on the edge you are, the harder it, the, typically the harder it is to iterate in a, in a, in a really fast rapid inter, iteration um, uh, process because you're having to learn the tech or design the tech uh, at the same time you're trying to iterate it. So there tends to be a sweet spot that projects find for that time period. Um, and when you put your proposal in, it takes a while to get your, your, the, you know, your, your award. And so all this time changes and that brings to the, that is impossible to know. So one known unknown is where the tech is actually going to be and where the users are going to be. So we always know time versus tech and that the placement of tech. We always know that um, we're never gonna know where the tech is gonna be and where the users are gonna be. Um, and then the other piece is just how it plays out. Um, those are all things that I think are common in tech. The other known challenge that I think came up um, is with staffing. So in the Deepak and Nathan talked about how grad school students, those that cycle just doesn't work uh, continuously. So there needs to be a bridge. Um, uh, Sam and Kevin were talking about how, you know, hiring adults, put, put them in a, in, a, in, a, in a precarious position with respect to their, their, life, their life ways. And so where else can you look um, to, to find, so just staffing is the known challenge. If the, uh, what seems obvious at first may not be the best solution or the workable solution. Um, in terms of Alice and Prinda, when you all were talking about um, staffing of who, who feels responsible to, to what, how do you work with people um, when, they, they, when they feel responsible for themselves and or others, and where is that appropriate? And how do you deal with those, that, level of, that, that level of differentiation and where are you responsible and where, how do you help people let go? So that's known challenges. Then there was a whole bunch of things that you brought up that, that I would put under the category of feature, not a bug. And the, the, I think the, the first example, I'll start with um, Kevin and uh, Sam, a feature, not a bug. Failure is a feature if it causes you to always have to, as the morning session said, notice. You always have to be aware. So Kevin gave the example of if you're losing, if you're losing games in sports, you got to figure out. You have to do that authentic processing. Um, so being aware of, of that makes sense. Um, 
have to pay attention. Oh, you also have to look behind the curtain because what you find there, and one of the things that I think came across in all three groups is looking behind the curtain is that's where the creative force is. And it keeps you interested, keeps you motivated, but it also allows for a dynamic where you're not cons consistently at the center. One of the things I heard is a lot of team sport. I couldn't solve it. We couldn't solve it. We needed to look more extensively at our team, at our community of practice, at different models, different cultures and ways of being. Um, other areas of, of failure being a feature, not a bug. Um, Prinda talked about identity. Most, a lot of people talked about identity. Pr Prinda, Pr Prinda talked about it most um, directly in terms of who she is and her multiple identities, um, stereotype threat, how other people consider you. And then one thing that wasn't directly mentioned, I think by in, uh, wasn't directly mentioned, but came up across groups is intersectionality. Who are you in place and time with your multiple identities? And by having to negotiate oneself and multiple multiple places, cultures, um, ways of being is a very creative force and allows you flexibility. Um, folks talked about persistence and resilience. Um, but also, and also, the ability to move through space. So the last piece uh, is, is really got to a leadership point where failure is a feature of leadership. And part of the challenge that I heard you all embrace is how do we, be, how do we embody the leaders who see failure, who see failure, who see things not working, not going as planned, COVID, um, as a way to embrace and have compassion for oneself, grace for others, and the ability to learn from others. And so with that, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank Martin, um, and I look forward to interacting with you all informally.